here. We have been working our way through the first letter that Peter sent out to Gentile Christians who are suffering incredible persecution and just going through his letter and discovering that his letter is for us as well. And I have been blessed by it. I'm looking forward to it. We spent a couple Sabbaths going through chapter 1. We're now into chapter 2 of 1 Peter. If you have a Bible, you can open it up, follow along with me. I'm reading throughout in the New Living Translation. And I'm going to begin by reading the verse. I'm going to begin actually with verse 4. First of all, Peter begins by telling us that we should live holy lives, continuing the theme he has of chapter 1. And then he says this. I'm reading verses 4 to 9. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests, and through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and he is the stone that makes people stumble, and the rock that makes people fall. They stumble because they do not obey the message. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you're not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation in God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we explore this exciting passage from Peter's letter, that your Holy Spirit will prepare our hearts right now, just prepare our hearts to hear what it is that you would have us gain from this powerful passage, this con concentrated passage of Scripture. There's so much in it. I pray your Holy Spirit will speak individually to every single heart because we all need portions of this, if not all of it. Lord, I pray that we will all go home having received the message that we need today. And I pray that you will, that you will then give us the courage to call on you, to take its words to heart, put them into practice. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, it's amazing how little we know about Jesus' early years. We get a detailed account of his birth, for sure, followed by his family escape to Egypt, his refugees, and then we get almost nothing. I mean, other than a brief cameo when he is about 12. But other than that, we get nothing. We get no details of his time in Egypt or the long trip there and back. We know that Joseph and Mary and the toddler Jesus returned to Nazareth, where we're told that Joseph worked as a carpenter. Now, the word translated here as carpenter is actually the word tecton. Joseph was a tecton. And a tecton is a skilled laborer from which we get the word technician. It can occasionally mean carpenter, though that actually probably reflects the cultural lens of our European and English translators. A more common and logical translation of tecton from Scripture would be Joseph was a builder. Or more specifically, he was a stonemason. We maybe 
feel uncomfortable with that because it ruins the picture we have. We like that charming notion of Jesus working in dad's little shop, sawing boards and making tables and chairs. And I'm not saying that that's not possible. But when one considers the primary building material of the region and the far more frequent use of the word tecton, it's far more likely that Joseph and his sons were stone builders. If we were actually looking for an apt comparison to our world today, we might think of Joseph as a general contractor who built with stone. And his son Jesus would, of course, be expected to work alongside his dad. Now, if this is true, it, we need to kind of reimagine what Joseph and, of course, Jesus looked like because they were probably incredibly strong and perhaps even a little buff. Because every single stonemason or bricklayer or cement guy that I know, I mean, think about Mike Hebner or Bob Ahrens, I mean, they're all muscular guys, right? Also, if Jesus was a stonemason and a builder, and he was apprenticing under his tecton dad, it would explain why Jesus repeatedly draws on the metaphors of the builder more than anything else. He draws on the metaphors of stone and rock and foundations and houses. Jesus frequently refers to himself and to his followers, to the kingdom and to the gospel as a rock. He refers to himself as the rock and the foundation on which to build. It also might explain Jesus' rather unusual nickname for his first ever believer, Simon. He renames him in Greek, Petros, from which we get the word Peter, which means rock, named him rock. But Greek wasn't the primary language of either Jesus or Peter. They spoke Aramaic. So Peter's new name was actually Kepha, Kepha, Simon Peter, Kepha, the rock. Now, Simon Peter is most often called Cephas by the Apostle Paul, which is really just a Latinized pronunciation of the word Kepha. So Peter's name was Shimon Kepha, Simon the rock. Or I think he was more like Rocky. <laughs> There's been a great deal of dispute about what kind of a rock or stone Jesus intends Peter to be. Is he the foundation on which to build his church? When he says, upon this rock I build my church, is he talking about Peter? Or is Peter a mere stone among many stones, the first brick among bricks, by which Jesus is building himself a new house, a new temple. Now, as far as Peter is concerned, there's no confusion in this. Peter is not the chief stone. Jesus and Jesus only is the cornerstone. Peter continues his letter. He's writing, remember, to largely Gentile Christians who are suffering incredible persecution, and suffering under Nero's final solution, if you will. After exhorting his readers to holy living, he encourages them with these words. He writes in verse 4, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Now straight away, notice two things about this cornerstone. One, it's not Peter. And two, it's alive. I mean, talk about an oxymoron. I mean, a living stone. Peter never misses an opportunity in his sermons or in this letter to point out how his Savior, his King, and his very best friend is alive. Peter continues. He says, he, meaning Jesus, the cornerstone, was rejected by people and not just any people, his very own people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Now, this is, of course, theologically important, 
But think about Peter's readers. They're all experiencing rejection from their own people. Yet, like their Savior, they're chosen for a purpose. Even today, when we construct these large civic-type buildings, the builders will lay a single stone at the corner on which to build out from. Now, a cornerstone today is largely ceremonial, but in Peter's day, in Jesus' day, it was crucial. One perfect stone would be laid at the corner, and after that, every stone placement would be dependent upon its alignment with that stone. And if the cornerstone were not perfect in size and in placement and in dimensions, the entire building will fail. So Peter understands that nobody fits that comparison except Jesus. Jesus alone is the perfect measuring stone, the only rock by which we gain our meaning And our direction. Now, several of us, a couple of months ago, had the privilege this summer of touring the outer wall of the temple at the old city in Jerusalem. Now, this isn't the temple wall because the Romans long ago destroyed that wall, as Jesus predicted they would, without one stone even left on another. But the western wall of the outer court still stands today. And at the southwestmost corner, there lies one massive brick, and it's about 46 feet long. That is the cornerstone. Now, this is possibly the very stone that Peter is comparing to Jesus. Every single stone of the temple and its outer wall came out of a nearby rock quarry. And I find this so fascinating. This rock quarry was only about 100 yards from the temple. And every stone was taken out of that quarry. And there in that quarry, from which the stones of the temple came, Jesus would later be crucified. Right there in the quarry. As a matter of fact, the only thing that remained of the quarry is a single mound of unusable rock that kind of looked like a skull, and it was called Golgotha, the skull. The dramatic irony here. And it can't be lost on Peter how every stone cut and carved and hauled out of that quarry represents so much more than mere bricks in a wall. Peter sees the prophetic metaphor clearly, and he really wants his readers and listeners to see it as well. So he writes this, and you, and you are living stones. Notice we're, we're oxymorons too. We are living stones born out of Jesus' death. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. See, we are stones in God's new house that he's building for himself. His new temple called the church. What's more, Peter writes, you are holy priests. And through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. I mean, wow, Peter is squeezing so much juice out of this little image. We who believe, he's arguing, we who believe are not merely stones but we're living stones to form a living temple to replace the old dead temple of the old covenant. And in less than a decade of Peter's writing this letter, the unthinkable will happen. God's house, the old temple, will be absolutely demolished. But God had already long since moved out of his old digs. The torn veil was kind of like a a posted sign from God. I have moved. Yeah, God's house, the old temple, was demolished. But as he promised, Jesus himself raised up for himself a new house, a new temple, in just three days. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
God's new house would be like no other house. It would be a living, breathing, moving, worshiping, serving house. No longer would pilgrims have to journey to God's house. No, God's house was coming to them, to the world, because its stones aren't dead stones. The stones are priests. Peter tells his readers, tells us really, how we all serve not merely as building materials in this new temple, we serve as its priests. I mean, that's right, all of us, every one of us, serving the will of the high priest. So in what way are we priests? Because a couple years ago, Michelle bought me a Christmas present. She bought me my DNA test. And nothing in the DNA test said Levite. So what's Peter getting at here? Well, first, it's important that we remember that the primary work of a priest in the biblical time is to perform sacrifices, offering spiritual sacrifices that please God. Well, but the true lamb, having been sacrificed once and for all, for all the atonement, what sacrifices are left for us to perform? What are we supposed to sacrifice if we are priests? Here we can turn to Peter's friend, Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, in the Old Covenant, prestigious few could be priests but in the new covenant we're all priests all of us whether jew or gentile male or female we know what those old priests actually looked like and i'm going to say none of you look like this imagine walking downtown looking like that wearing that outfit especially in july or august so what exactly does a priest look like? Well, look around you. Look at the person sitting next to you. So what is our task as priests? I mean, most of us have never been a priest before, so a job description would be kind of nice. The passage in Romans tells us that we are to offer our spiritual act of worship. It is to offer up ourselves to God, not as dead sheep or doves or rams, because Christ already died once for all. Death is done. Done. Rather than having been made alive, now that we've been made alive in Him, well, now we can present ourselves, our bodies, living in all, to Jesus. So how do we do this? Well, we do so by worshiping Jesus, by obeying Jesus, by following Jesus, by sharing Jesus, by consuming Jesus, by willingly doing anything Jesus asks of us. And instead of killing sheep for sacrifice, now we are commanded to feed the sheep. How? Well, by loving our neighbors as ourselves by loving the least of these, maybe providing food for the community with a garden, maybe visiting the sick or clothing the naked and taking care of the widows and the children. I mean, think about it. What a cool but weird temple this is. And what a tragedy that we've completely misunderstood the point of this thing we call church. We don't worship. We don't serve in order to meet our needs, in order to feed our hunger pangs, in order to feel chummy among our friends. Now, Jesus often gives us these wonderful perks as part of serving. But if we've come for that, well, we've missed the point altogether. We are here right now solely for one purpose, and that is to present ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices to Jesus and to his body.
as living stones laid upon each other, everything we do should align with the perfect cornerstone by aligning ourselves to his perfect dimensions. And that's why. That's why we dig deeply into the scriptures, not because in them we think we find salvation, but because they tell us about the cornerstone. And in doing so, we find ourselves interconnected with other living stones, aligning ourselves all with the one stone. It all comes back to the cornerstone. Always the cornerstone. While cutting out stones for the temple, a fascinating story emerges from about 2,000 years ago. External sources tell us how the quarrymen cut out one particularly large stone because it seemed just too perfect to dice up into smaller stones. But unfortunately, once they hauled this enormous stone to the building site, the rock seemed too big, too unwieldy. And not knowing what to do with this enormous stone, they dragged it off to the side and they left it there. And it stayed there for several years. Grass grew up around it while the workers tackled other things, causing the big stone to actually become kind of a hazard. It tripped people up, and got in the way, and even people got hurt by it. However, when it came time to at last piece together the outer wall, the builders realized how this enormous stone was indeed the perfect stone perfectly solid, perfectly sized, and perfectly cut, that rock would be the cornerstone. Now, in citing this familiar story, and this story would be familiar to many people, Peter draws his reader's attention to the messianic prophecy found in Isaiah 28, verse 16. Now, this prophecy, you have to remember, is written more than 650 years before Herod's temple was ever built. And here's what the prophecy says. It says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Peter adds, in case his readers miss that, yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given to him. Jesus is that stone. We who see Jesus for who he truly is, we understand how Jesus alone is worthy to be the cornerstone. He alone is the perfect gauge by which everything else must be aligned. And Peter goes on brilliantly here, connecting Jesus to the messianic prophecies found in the Psalms, And also back in Isaiah, he writes this, But as for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he, Jesus, is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. Peter here comes to his key point, and it must not be lost on us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Peter, allows for only one of two options. Only one of two responses. Upon encountering the cornerstone that is Jesus, every one of us must and will respond one way or the other. What will our response be? Will we declare him our rock foundation, the foundation on which we will cling for dear life? Or will we crash into him like a, head-on collision in the freeway. We smash into them full force. One outcome or the other. One response or the other. There never seems to be a mushy middle when encountering the gospel. Now, Peter isn't putting forward any sort of a tolerant buffet of options here. While the gospel unites people who believe piecing us together into a mighty living temple, it remains the ultimate divider, the ultimate wedge between two distinct choices. Now, I am becoming ever more convinced, as a matter of fact, I'd say I'm 100% convinced 
that Jesus brings about only complete embrace or complete rejection. Never a yawn, never a shrug, and never a whatever. I believe Jesus hints at this himself in Matthew when he says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Here Jesus then quotes the Messianic prophecy in Micah 7, 6, where he says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. The gospel, it unites true believers. It unites those who are in Christ. But, hear me please, it divides true believers and lukewarm believers. It very likely may divide those within our own congregations and our own homes. I think that's because there is no room for compartmentalized faith when it comes to the cornerstone. And there can be only one cornerstone. But how? I mean, how is it possible that Jesus could ever trip anybody up? How is anybody tripped up by Jesus? How could we stub a big toe on him or stumble over him? Well, Peter tells us in the next verse. He says this, they stumble because they do not obey the message. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. When we reject the message, and the word Peter uses here for message is the logos, the word who was in the beginning, that is Jesus. When we reject the message that is Jesus, the word, the gospel, we will stumble every time. But Peter encourages them saying, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you could show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Peter's audience, we can't forget this ever, Peter's audience is literally being tortured, some to death. Many have already lost their jobs, their status in the community, their respect among friends and family, all for the cause of Christ. But Peter comes with encouragement. So if you need some encouragement today, hear Peter out. Because he says, no matter what, remember this, that you and I are a part of something bigger. Bigger than Rome. Bigger than Washington, D.C. Bigger than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bigger than our community here in Lincoln. Bigger than our jobs. Bigger than our families. You are a living stone in a living temple connected to the living cornerstone. And this temple can never be torn down. It can't be burned down. It can't be stopped. It can't be defeated. This temple even does something more amazing. It moves. It can move into regions where it's not wanted. It can even go underground if necessary. When you or I walk into a hospital room, a, a, a neighbor's house, a nursing home, a coffee shop, this temple moves with us because we are connected to the cornerstone. When you or I worship Jesus, when we help those in need, those who need help, when we love the unlovable and serve the least of these, we are serving as this remarkably weird and wonderful temple's priests. And when I wake up on a Sabbath morning and I wonder if I should crawl out of bed, well, it begins to dawn on me that I'm not a rogue stone. I am just one stone among many stones. And these stones need me as much as I need them. And that's true for all of us. We are all connected, tightly connected, linked by the chief stone, by the cornerstone, the living cornerstone. We are all of us connected to Jesus. So be encouraged. 
be encouraged. We are, we are a part of God's moving, God's remarkable, God's serving, God's worshiping house. And that's no small thing. And I encourage us to, to take that seriously and, and to think on that. It gives me courage. It reminds me that I'm here for a purpose. There is reason for me being here. We used to say, we used to have the slogan, we're building something here. Well, what are we building? You know what we're building? We're actually just allowing Jesus to use us, living stones, to build his church. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for the encouragement of Peter. Even 2,000 years later, it, it gives us courage in a world that seems dark, in a world that seems bleak, in a world that doesn't even like us. And yet, you are building yourself a house, a living house out of living stones and we are those stones made alive because you have pulled us from the quarry in which you bled and died we live because jesus lives and we want to align ourselves with jesus the cornerstone father god i pray that we will be reminded why we do this thing called church we do it because we are called to be living stones in a living temple. Father God, I pray that you will give each one a wonderful Sabbath, that you will give each one a wonderful, just peaceful day, a day to stop, but I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to prick at us, continue maybe even to bother us a little, and remind us each how we fit in to this weird and wonderful temple. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.